Hello everyone and welcome back to your daily government and financial news update. As always, I'm interested in hearing your thoughts on everything, so make sure to give this video a like, but also leave a comment giving your thoughts on everything that is currently going on. Okay, so President Biden spent the day yesterday announcing some new and exciting climate change programs. Of course, rather ironically, before giving a speech on climate change, he was escorted in by a massive motorcade of, well, no other than good old gas guzzling SUVs. What better way to announce a bunch of new climate change programs than to arrive with a couple dozen of those gas guzzlers? Now, the first program Biden announced is to provide $2.3 billion in funding that will help communities prepare for disasters. To do this, they'll expand flood control and retrofitting buildings, as well as leveraging funding to help low-income families cover heating and cooling costs. Furthermore, the President is also directing the Department of Interior to propose new offshore wind areas in the Gulf of Mexico, a plan that could potentially power more than 3 million homes and advance the transition to clean energy. Of course, this transition to so-called green energy brings up a lot of concerns. For example, some people are concerned that during a heat wave, they may not be able to use air conditioning or, in the winter, they may not have enough energy to heat their homes. When Pete Buttigieg is confronted with this dilemma of us potentially not having the power to heat or cool our homes over these green policies, this is what he had to say. I have kind of a, a philosophical question about, about how, we, uh, how we approach things um, in, in terms of dealing with, uh, with emissions and dealing with trying to, trying to cut down on, on the use of fossil fuels and how we deal with what Europe might be facing. And what I mean by that is there are real possibilities that people might not have air conditioning during a heat wave or in the in the winter that they may not have enough energy to heat their uh, to heat their homes at this point. Now, the mitigation factors that, that we're employing to try to cut down on emissions, those really aren't going to cut CO2 emissions till probably 2030. And while we're dealing with these, um, we've got India building coal plants, we've got China building coal plants, just hand over fist and, and emitting and, and not really uh, helping our efforts whatsoever. When wind and solar won't power the homes in Europe, how do we not use hydrocarbons to make sure that near term these people aren't either freezing or dying from the heat? It, it seems like a real quandary at this point to try to do these, to near term try to do these things when near term we need power, we need energy. So how do you declare? Well, I will say, how do you declare a climate crisis in the middle of an actual weather crisis? Well, look, uh, obviously those those two things are closely related. I mean, it's uh, more than 100 degrees in London today, or at least it was yesterday. Uh, we've seen things happen in the Pacific Norwe Northwest in the U.S. that are supposed to be basically all but statistically impossible, and they're happening more and more often. But this is what a transition looks like, right? This is exactly the challenge that we're living through. You can't flip a switch. You can't do it overnight. So to Pete Buttigieg, houses may not be able to cool in the middle of a heat wave, but hey, it's just a transition we'll need to go through. I mean, you want to talk about someone completely out of touch with regular Americans? Here's your guy. Later on, Buttigieg also said that he's astonished that some folks seem to really struggle to let go of their gas-powered vehicles in favor of electric vehicles, as if ditching our current car in favor of an electric one is a real viable option for most people. I'm still astonished that, that some folks, uh, and, and uh, I felt this, uh, I was testifying in Congress yesterday, uh, some folks seem to really uh, struggle to let go of the status quo. What's funny though, is that every single day we're constantly being preached down upon about climate control and how we really should be more careful about how green we are, 
Yet, we have John Kerry in his private jet, who is a special presidential envoy for climate, putting out more than 300 metric tons of carbon dioxide since President Biden took office. And just to put that into perspective, that's the same equivalent to driving 747,000 miles in a gas-fueled vehicle. The nation's climate czar, yeah, we have one, John Kerry, called out for being an energy hypocrite Federal data now showing Kerry's massive carbon footprint because his family's gas-guzzling private jet has racked up 48 trips since President Biden was sworn in. John Kerry's family ride has put out more than 300 metric tons of carbon dioxide. I looked it up at the EPA website. That is equivalent to driving 747,000 miles in a gas-fueled vehicle. One more point of hypocrisy. Right now, the White House is pushing massive spending to kill fossil fuels, making gas scarce. So, whether you're being escorted in by a couple dozen gas guzzling SUVs or taking trips around the world in a private jet, the Biden administration sure seems to go by their own set of rules. Sort of like during the COVID lockdowns when we had politicians like Governor Gavin Newsom hosting dinner parties while his constituents had to stay home and couldn't even visit their dying family members in the hospital. It's really becoming a common theme, so should we really even be surprised anymore? It's also probably a huge chunk of the reason that President Biden has quickly become one of the most unpopular presidents of all time, according to pretty much any poll released. Oh, and in case anyone thought Kamala Harris could become any more unpopular herself, Kamala Harris did what Kamala Harris does best and started laughing when talking about high gas prices. Yeah, what we need to do domestically, what we need to do to bring down the cost of gas. Uh, well, right? <laughs> right? I seen a meme the other day that said, me Googling online how to make gas at home. Okay? Ooh, don't do that. <laughs> don't do that. <laughs> Please don't do that. Hilarious. <laughs> yeah, uh, I don't think anyone else is laughing. Meanwhile, as CBS reports, Americans are now not just facing inflation, but also shrinkflation. For me, this is something that I've noticed for quite a while now, actually. You know, when you go to a grocery store and the box of cereal has the same price as before, but the box seems to have shrunk in half. Yeah, that's this new term we're hearing, shrinkflation. The next time you're shopping, check closely. This Life cereal box recently got taller, but it lost two and a half ounces. That's almost a bowl and a half of cereal. Experts call it shrinkflation. Unfortunately, we're in the middle of a tidal wave of shrinkflation uh, because of inflation. Ed Dworsky founded ConsumerWorld.org, a consumer resource guide that investigates trends like shrinkflation. It's a very sneaky way to pass on a price increase. But he says companies are dealing with rising costs just like the rest of us. They know consumers will notice a direct price increase, but they won't notice if the product gets a little bit smaller. These Charmin toilet paper packages look the same, but Dworsky says the rolls recently got shorter by 30 sheets. In 2008, ice cream came in half-gallon cartons. Then they went down to 56 ounces, and the current size is 48. But ice cream maker Tillamook was very open about its decision, saying in order to be profitable, they decided on the option that would be least disruptive to their fans and keep the price the same. They chose to cut the size by 14%. That means this carton used to have this much more ice cream. Check out these bags of dog food. The larger bag said you were getting three pounds free. The smaller bag says you're getting four pounds free for the same price. What gives? There's no free lunch, even for your dog. It went from 50 pounds to 44 that's all you need to know. Forget about all the fanciful marketing language. And it's hard to tell one of these bottles of dish soap has a half ounce left. Okay, now moving into some news regarding stimulus checks. If you happen to be one of the 150,000 or so residents in Johnson County, Iowa, you might just be eligible for a stimulus payment. Under their direct assistance program for low-income residents, they'll be sending out $1,400 stimulus checks to single filers who earn under $45,370 per year. For two-person households, the maximum that can be earned is $51,870, and for four-person households, the maximum being $64,805. Payments for these are expected to arrive before the end of July. Furthermore, as mentioned in a video earlier this week, 
If you live in the state of Indiana or Maine, you also have a possibility of receiving a stimulus check as early as this week, with Maine sitting out the highest amount, totaling $850 per person. And even though your state may not have made the list in today's video, more and more states seem to be approving relief payments, whether it be from a surplus in their budgets or just extra money sitting around from federal COVID relief. So you never know, your state may just be the next one. Okay, so now it's time to move into some money news where the S&P 500 ended the day in the green up 0.59%, and the NASDAQ also made some gains on the day up 1.58%. Futures for today are in the red though, with the Dow Jones, S&P 500, and NASDAQ all down by 0.32%. Bitcoin has slipped up by 1.92% over the last day, but is still up by 16% in the last week, so it's made some pretty good jumps as of late. So with stocks and Bitcoin both making moves to start the second half of the year, if you would like to get started investing or just receive a few stocks for free, in the comment section below, I will be pinning a comment where you can receive six free stocks and $5 worth of Bitcoin from my partner in Webull. Additionally, I will be leaving another link where you can receive yet another stock from my partner in Robinhood at absolutely no cost to you. But on that note, I'm going to go ahead and wrap up this video. If you enjoyed the content in today's video and you would like to see more like it, I would encourage you to give this video a like, subscribe to my channel, and also make sure to ring the notification bell. That way, you will be the very first to be notified when I do release future videos. And until next time, I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day, and I'll see you in the next video.